Hey everybody, it's Jen. Welcome back to Joyful Living. Today I am doing a Q&A. Uh, this is in part to celebrate 20,000 subscribers here on YouTube. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that at the end of the video, but I'm just really glad that you're here today and I wanna jump right into your questions. Everything from my family life, to my career, to being on YouTube, to just all kinds of stuff. So yeah, let's get started. So you guys were so kind to submit questions both on the community tab here on YouTube and also over on Instagram. If you are not following me over there, I would love to see you. I am at Gemma Forge on all of the things. And your questions were not only really just good, thoughtful questions, but they really got me thinking. So I have them on a um, document that's on my computer. My computer is right here in front of me. Let's just dive right into the deep end, shall we? Um, it is some such an honor to be speaking to you guys during Pride Month. If you follow me on anything, you know that Pride is very important to me. I absolutely consider myself an ally. Many, many, many people I love identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community. So a couple of your questions, very just to get those out of the way in the beginning, were around that. And I love the way that they were worded. Um, this first one says, any meaningful or actionable ways we can be an ally to the LGBTQ plus community. I am very concerned about the continued increase in hate and violence. And I just want to say that I am also very concerned about it. It is why I am such a staunch ally. I think it's very easy to think that this is someone else's problem, but the reality is anything that is to do with human rights is everybody's problem and it takes all of our voices in order to bring about change. It's editing, Jen. Um, I wasn't really happy with the way that this section, how I expressed myself, because the question was really about actionable steps and I didn't feel like I expressed that really very well. So I'm going to come back and insert in here now um, three ways that you can be an ally. Okay, the first way is to vote. So make sure you know where all of the candidates that are running for anything that you're able to vote in stand when it comes to LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus rights. Make sure you vote for those candidates, support those candidates with your money if you can, of course with your vote, with your time if you can volunteer with those candidates. That is how we protect rights, that is how we ensure rights, and that is how we bring about change in this country. So number one is vote. And number two is to give your money to LGBTQ plus causes. I did say this in the video, but I'll put some resources below of specific places that you can donate to. And number three is don't put up with garbage from people in your sphere. Um, if you are in a more conservative community, this can be a challenge, but you need to be speaking up at any and every opportunity. And even if you're the only person in the room doing it, if you want to know how am I an ally, um, you are an ally by speaking out and against hate at any and every opportunity. It is more important than ever. We cannot mess around. Rights are not a given right now. Um, I'm very nervous about the future of our country. If those of us that are on the right side of history don't start speaking a little more loudly, a little more boldly, and we do need to give with our money, with our time, and with our voice. So there, I said it better that time. <laughs> So this this person wanted to know, uh, some of my favorite moments on your channel are the street screen time you give to the piano player in Disneyland. So that would be on my Disney Focus channel. And of course, the way you join in song with Joyful Abandon. Yes, I do. Did you grow up singing or performing as a former show choir nerd? I have to know. Well, Yes. Yes, I did. In fact, I have talked about this in a couple of different videos, but I'll mention it here as well. I started being involved with community theater at the ripe age of nine years old. Prior to that, I was in a ballet studio most of the time. Um, I was actually extremely shy, but I knew that I wanted to be on the stage. So I started scouring our local newspaper for any and all auditions and insisted that my mom take me up to the local community theater, which was the Crichton Community Playhouse in Conroe, Texas. For those of you that know it, um, I auditioned and was chosen for a role in the Sound of Music. I went on to do many productions at Crichton and then many productions um, just throughout my young adult and teenage years. I actually toured with a group for a while uh, professionally and singing has been part of 
who I am and my DNA since a very, very young age. My parents spent thousands of dollars on dance lessons and vocal coaching. I was always in acting workshops and I did have a dream of becoming a performer. Um, I was actually uh, traveling all the way up until my oldest son, who's now 25, was uh, just about nine months old. And then I realized that it was really not conducive to how I wanted to parent. Things have changed a lot over the years. I think that might have worked more in today's environment than it did 25 years ago. Uh, but I, I bowed out of that. Um, I ended up singing in a cover band for a few years. It was just in my neighborhood and we did weddings and, and you know, bar mitzvahs and, and all that kind of thing. And um, yeah, I've just always found some avenue in my life to perform. And I do feel like my YouTube channel is just an extension of all of that. So singing, very important to me. Countless hours, countless dollars spent training these vocal cords and yeah, I, I'd love to use them whenever I can. So these next few questions are all career related. Um, you guys always have a lot of career questions for me. Uh, I was in various fields for 25 years. Um, I worked full time the entire time my kids were growing up. I had a very fulfilling career, um, but it was, it was a lot. And I loved all of the different jobs that I had, but doing YouTube and working for myself has been, it, I, I don't even have words for how fulfilling that it has been. So again, thank you to you guys for supporting me in a way that allows me to still do that. Uh, but a lot of people find themselves in a space, especially when they're in their 40s and 50s, where they really would like to make a shift because they look at, you know, kind of the rest of their lives and they're like, I don't know that I want to be doing this. And 65 is retirement is just not really a thing anymore. Like most of us just want to work as long as we can. Um, so someone asked, what do you recommend for someone wanting to make a career change? And I love the saying, which usually is used in terms of civil rights, but it really applies to everything, that change is incremental. Uh, you will hear stories of someone who was in a career that they just couldn't stand and they, they quit and they walked out and they started a whole brand new life. But I think more realistic for most people, this was certainly the case with me, is to start dreaming about what you would be doing if you weren't doing what you were what you are currently doing, and then to start slowly pursuing that on the side. So maybe it's that you've always wanted to be a speech pathologist. And, and by the way, let me say at the outset, I think it is literally never too late to go back to school, to get another degree, to get another certification, to pursue something that you've always dreamed about. I really don't feel like you need to limit yourself because, oh, I can't do that because I'm this age. I don't think that exists. So let's put that out of our minds. But in my speech pathologist um, analogy, can you just quit your job and go become a speech pathologist? Well, no. I mean, there's classes to take and there's certification required. So I would say start researching that career path. Start seeing what would it take? Do you need to take some kind of test in order, you know, do you need to take a, a I want to say LSAT, but that's not what I mean. I'm sure that there's some equivalent that you would need to take in order to go to school, the GRE or whatever the case may be. Start formulating a plan for making that shift happen. Because if there's one thing you learn in midlife, it's that those years are gonna come and go no matter what. And so all of a sudden, spending four or five or six years to completely shift careers doesn't feel like such a big deal anymore. And not that it wouldn't be a lot of work and not that there wouldn't be a lot of sacrifice, but it's completely plausible that you could go out and do those things. So um, change is incremental, start researching what you can, what tangible steps would you need to take? One thing that I feel is not helpful is just to sit and stew and complain about the job that you have. And sometimes having another goal, something to aspire to, and then working your way through what the steps would be required and researching that can go so far in just helping us not be discouraged when we wake up every morning because we've all had those jobs where that alarm goes off. In my case, it was usually 5 or 5.30 a.m. And we're like, oh, Jesus, take the wheel. I don't want to do this today. And 
you know, everyone feels that way some days, but if you feel that way every day, maybe start, you know, thinking about a plan. Uh, but then when you put some of your energy, maybe the energy that you were using to complain about your job into what could it look like instead, um, it does a lot. It gives you a lot of just joy and mental fortitude and we're resilient people and change and being um, flexible and pliable and able to to flex to the new reality that we find ourselves is such an amazing life skill and the journey towards that change can be almost as fulfilling as the change itself so that would be my advice start today and this is sort of along the YouTube creator lines and it made me laugh. What's the most common reaction you get when telling people you make your living as a YouTube creator? Scoffs, confusion, criticism, intrigue? How do you deal with negative reactions? I thought this was really interesting because I have definitely seen a shift um, in the four years that I have been a YouTube creator. Gosh, in November, it'll be going on five years, which is crazy. But um, in the beginning, of course, people looked at me like I was nuts. I got a lot of, you know, why. I got a lot of um, sometimes scoffs. Uh, one particular orthopedic surgeon I went to was like, can you please tell me what a content creator is with like, you know, the eyebrow thing and, and all of the stuff. Uh, but over time, I think because the gig economy is like the fastest growing sector and uh, content creation has become such, if it's not a, a trillion dollar industry, it's certainly a billion dollar industry. And there are so many of us in the field now that um, it, it really now does not get scoffs anymore. Now I'm getting a lot more of, um, you know, well, what do I do if I want to start a channel? My, my son wants to start a channel. My business needs to start a channel because most businesses in today's day and age really do need a content creation segment of their business, whether that's through social media itself, like Instagram or Twitter, whether that's, you know, long form content, like what I do here on YouTube. I always, people are like, oh, is that a real job? I'm like, well, I just made my quarterly tax payment. So according to the IRS, yes, it is a real job. <laughs> and I, I guess that's part of the beauty of being in your 50s is if people don't get it, it's not really my problem, especially today. Like, I, I think everyone is kind of smart enough to know um, that this is a real thing. It is a real job. It is a very competitive field. It is very hard to make, certainly to make enough money to eke out a living or even to make any money as a side hustle. So you do have to know what you're doing. You have to play the game a little bit. You have to be willing to put in the hours, especially in the beginning where there's no money at all. And if you are looking for a coach or a consultant, I do that. I only work with about two to three clients at a time. So I'm typically very booked up. But if you want to reach out about the possibility of working with me, I will put all the information on how to do that. Um, or you could just go to gemlaforge.com and at the top it says YouTube Consulting. Click on that and it will give you all of the steps and tell you what to do. Okay, now we're going to move into some parenting questions. My husband, Scott, and I have raised three sons. They are wonderful. I adore them. Um, their lives are exciting and wonderful and ever-changing. Um, it was, it, you know, did we do a good job? I don't know if we did the best job. I know we did the best that we could do with the resources that we had. And I know that I adore my kids. I love the human beings that they've become. So I don't really know as a parent that we can ask for more than that. And we have really good relationships with all of our kids. So I will, I will take that as a, we did a good job. Uh, but my 11 year old daughter is starting middle school in the fall. Any mom advice for this new season of parenting? And then someone else asked, um, what did you do to help prepare your sons for college? And although those may seem like two very different questions, my advice for both of those questions would be the same. And that is do more listening than you do talking and just be solid. Hang in there with them listen to their fears, listen to their concerns. It may seem like, you know, an 11 year old going into middle school and a student going off to college, like that's not even the same phase. How is your advice the same? Well, because I think hanging in there with your kids and listening more than you talk is, is probably the best rule of thumb for every single phase. Uh, children, when they're younger, and then even as they get into young adults, they are looking to you to be the grown up. They're looking to you to be calm. They're looking to you when they are fearful. And whether they are starting preschool or kindergarten or middle school or high school or college, 
there's a lot of fear. And typically the way humans express fear is through anger. So um, this kind of goes along with someone asked, what was the best advice you ever got from a therapist? And it was this, it was that understand when people are angry, what they really are is fearful. And when you view that child um, that is super angry at you, which is going to happen at all of the different phases, even as a little two-year-old all the way through, certainly through adolescence, when they are at their angriest is when they are most afraid. And it is your job as the adult in the room to figure out what it is they're afraid of. And the truth is a lot of times you're afraid too. So you might respond in anger right back at them. And and first of all, forgive yourself if you do that because God knows we did it. Um, but we tried to do that less and less as we knew better. And the reality is there's a grown up in the room and guess what? It's you. So keep your cool, hang in there with your kids, let them speak. Don't always assume you know what's best. You might not. But what you can do is just wrap your arms around them and make sure they know no matter what is going on with you, I am here. And and that honestly is all you can do. Um, we're not perfect. We're not superheroes. We can't, you know, everyone, I, I heard this on NPR once, everyone wants their kids to be resilient, but no one wants their kids to have to go through anything. Well, you can't get resilience without going through things. Your kids are going to go through things. Your middle school daughter is going to be, um, you know, probably bullied. She's probably going to get her feelings hurt. Someone is going to break her heart. Your college kids are going to be in dangerous situations. They're going to have to make difficult choices. They're going to struggle with time management. These bad things are going to happen. But if you clutch your pearls and freak out as your kids go through these stages, you're really not helping. And what happens is it just becomes a situation where they don't want to tell you things because they don't want to listen to you freak out. They're afraid, they need you. And if you don't navigate that well and listen, then they won't go to you um, when they're struggling. So I guess that's all I have to say about that. Um, okay, and then this last one is something I'm not going to get into a lot because I actually just did a video um, for um, Organized HQ. If you guys have ever heard of it, there's a whole bunch of YouTubers that are involved with it. And I was lucky enough to submit a video this year. They asked me to work with them. And it is all around this next question, which is um, what are the rules when young adults live at home? I think a lot of us are dealing with this right now. And literally that whole video was devoted to that. So watch this space and when that video goes live, I'll give you guys all the information you need on how to watch it and how to watch all of the other great videos because that's a very important topic to me. Okay, let's move into um, some travel questions because you know I love to talk about travel. Um, this first one made me laugh and it, it made me laugh for two reasons because most people would never think of there being good food in an airport and second because I knew my answer right away. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, what is your favorite restaurant at Atlanta Airport? So I have two, one if I'm in a hurry, one if I have some time. Uh, if I'm in a hurry, I love Cat Cora's restaurant. Um, I believe it's in Terminal B. Don't quote me on that. Um, it's wherever most of the Delta Gates are. Love her restaurant. Their breakfast in particular is mwah, so good. The staff in there is always great. It's not a huge restaurant, but super, super good. And they're always really fast. In fact, the last time I was in there with my husband, um, the server was so sweet and kind because Scott used his ID to get a discount because he's an airline pilot. She was like, oh, just tell him thank you for how hard that he's working. And we all know how hard they're working right now. It's like, so sweet. Um, and this is from a woman who works in food service at the airport and she was telling us thank you. So, you know, anyway, they're just great in there. So go visit them. And then my favorite nice restaurant at Atlanta airport. And you're like, wait, there's a nice restaurant at Atlanta airport. Oh yes, there is. It is called One Flew South. Terminal E, pretty sure Terminal E. It's either E or F. No, it's got to be E because F is all international. This restaurant, this is their only location. It is actually considered fine dining. The sushi is amazing. The servers in there are amazing. It is like, to me, if you come to Atlanta, it is not to be missed. Whether you, you know, leave early for a flight so you can eat there before, or if you come in and you wanna eat there before you ever even leave the airport, it is incredible. It's a little pricey. So like check the menu ahead of time so you know what you're getting into. But yeah, one flew south. So good. 
Okay, more travel questions. Do you have any trips planned with all three boys and Scott? I do. Um, I, however, do not vlog my trips with the five of us. Um, my family does not want to be part of my channel, which I completely respect. And so um, sometimes I think it seems like I only ever travel by myself. I actually travel quite a bit with everybody or with various um, members of my family, but I don't vlog those trips because that's just our personal family time. Um, also, they're here quite a lot. Um, they, they're living in different places, but everybody is home pretty frequently um, on the weekends or whatever. So yeah, we get a lot of great family time. I just don't bring that to you guys. But yeah, very, very grateful for my amazing children. Any international trips planned this year? So I don't have any on the books at the moment. International travel has been a little tricky. Um, and obviously with, and I know that the testing requirements just changed. So that has opened it up, but that means that the flights are really, really, really full. Um, I hope, hope to get out to at least London in the fall. Uh, London is such an easy flight for me. It's, I know where I'm going. I know where I stay. By the way, I always stay at the K plus K uh, George Hotel uh, in Kensington. So if you're wanting to know what my favorite hotel is, um, it's right there by the Earl's Court Station. It's perfectly located for me. It's easy to get to from the airport, all of the things. Um, so hopefully I have a London trip coming up in the fall. And international travel for me, I kind of usually like to go in shoulder season or when not everybody else is traveling. And so far it is kind of yet to slow down from, uh, you know, with all of the pandemic stuff. So Hopefully. That was a lot of words to just say, hopefully. Um, and this is one that's not travel related. I probably should have done this one in the home section, but um, do you have plans to move into a different home now that your boys are grown or are you and Scott happy with where you are currently for long term? Um, you know, right now with this, the craziness of housing, I think we're just going to stay put. Um, we love our home. It's convenient to, um, Scott always takes MARTA into the airport, which is our, our um, train here in Atlanta. And um, we love our home. We love our neighborhood. Um, and it just makes us really happy to be here. So we don't have any plans to move anytime soon. We had toyed with the idea of him switching bases and relocating maybe to California or Washington State. We have since scrapped all those plans. Um, he has nine years left before retirement, and I'm pretty sure, you never know, life's very uncertain, but I'm pretty sure we're gonna spend those years right here. Tons of questions about the fur babies. Everybody wants to know about Lenny and Sadie, who are the dogs that we have been fostering. I have already expressed this on social media, so I feel very fine telling you about it now. We have decided to adopt them. Um, I. I'm editing right now a week in the life video vlog where I will get into a little more detail about that. That will be up next week. So make sure you um, are subscribed and have those notification bells on because I'll go into all of that um, with you guys, the details about how that happened. But yes, they are now officially La Forges. They are part of our family. We can't imagine not having them here. And they have just been such a happy surprise in our lives. We're really happy with our household now and our three fur babies, Scooby, Lenny, and Sadie. So now I want to get into a little bit about the channel, what happens next, what the heck is going on. Um, we have had such growth recently. In fact, for a while there, I was growing at maybe like five or 600 subscribers a month. The last few months, I've had five or 6,000 new subscribers a month, which, you know, I feel like that can't possibly continue. And that feels like a little crazy to me. Uh, but you guys are really showing so much enthusiasm for the content I'm doing here. So I do intend to keep making content. Um, I know that I've been really travel heavy as of late, but that's because that's what you guys have been expressing that you want. So there will be a lot more travel content coming up. But my journey here on Joyful Living has been so beautiful for me because when I first started my other channel and it was more Disney focused, I always knew I wanted to talk more about what it was like here at home, about what does it mean to create a space where we find joy. And so in addition to the travel content, I'll be putting more of that on this channel as well. Hopefully a lot more health and fitness content um, as I am, I'm still perimenopausal right now, but I've got menopause right around the corner and, and I know Know all of those things and all of those changes. So I will be talking about those things as well, how that 
might affect health and fitness and, and all of the other things. Um, but mostly this, it, this space is going to continue to be very flexible and it will change as I change. Someone said something to me on Twitter about, you know, I love your videos. Don't ever change. Well, I can never promise that. I will always be changing and evolving in my job and in this space as I'm changing and evolving as a person. I love that about being human. I love that the different phases of our lives can look so completely different. Uh, but no matter what happens next, I really want you guys to be along for the ride. So thank you for 20,000 subscribers. As this goes up, we will probably all, <laughs> already be at 23,000 subscribers, which again, Thank you that I, I don't feel worthy of that at all. So thank you to all of you that continue to watch and continue to enjoy the content. And I'm just very grateful for what I get to do. I'm grateful for my home. I'm grateful for my sweet dogs, my family, and I'm grateful for you. So whatever you're doing today, I hope you're finding joy. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Give the video a big thumbs up and I'll see you next time. Bye.